So you see in people who have liver issues, they have a high amount of SIBO, small intestine bacteria overgrowth. Um, and so they, they are directly correlated. When you have liver issues, you typically have gut issues and so forth. Hey guys, welcome back to the Digest This Podcast. I'm your host, Bethany Cameron. And today I'm joined by Dr. Asia Mohammed as we discuss the gut-liver connection and dive deep into how the liver affects so many different areas of our body. Dr. Asia has treated thousands of patients with digestive disorders with a holistic approach and specializes in fatty liver disease and the gut microbiome. Our conversation is something many don't talk about enough, but today we are. So be sure to listen till the very end. But before we get into this episode, shout out to podcast listener, Miss Nicolette V, who wrote... I was born with digestive issues and have battled to find answers and even more so finding solutions. The amount of information I've received following her is truly outstanding. The results are nothing short of a miracle. If you're committed to your health journey, keep an open mind and trusting the process. This is a must have in your podcast repertoire. Thank you so much, Nicolette, for this podcast review. And I thoroughly enjoy reading every single one. And if you haven't done so already, I do encourage you to give your opinion and rate and review the podcast. That helps get the podcast out into more ears and it helps people find the podcast so that hopefully they can benefit from these episodes as well. So thank you so much for all the love and support. If you want a $200 Amazon gift card, all you have to do is give this show a five-star rating and review, and I'll be sending someone this special gift. Just be sure to include your Instagram handle at the end of the review because that is the way I will be reaching out and perhaps sliding into your DMs. So pause this episode and rate and review for your chance to get a $200 Amazon gift card. Turns out, Everything you think you knew about probiotics may be wrong. It can get pretty confusing with the market saturated with probiotic everything. Let me give you my personal take and share what I got introduced to back in October. Seeds DS01 plant-based capsule is not only a probiotic, but a prebiotic. There are 24 strains of specifically formulated probiotics targeted for digestive health, gut immunity, as well as additional systemic benefits. There's actually a prebiotic capsule encapsulating the probiotic inside, which ensures that the probiotics actually make it to your colon with 100% survivability to do its job. Many think of pre and probiotics as only gut support. It does support the gut barrier, but Seeds DS01 also supports other areas of the body for whole body benefits, skin health, heart health, and micronutrient synthesis. Healthy regularity and an ease of bloating are just a few other common perks you may experience So if you want something to help balance out your bowels and start a new healthy habit for the new year and your life, visit seed.com slash digest20 and use code digest20 to redeem 20% off your first month of Seed's DS01 Daily Symbiotic. Thank you so much, Dr. Asia, for coming on the show today. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be on your show. Yay. So I want to talk about the the gut-liver connection. Um, but first, first of all, what does the liver do and why should we care so much about caring for our liver? Yeah. So our liver is obviously a multifaceted organ. And I think just in the world of health and wellness now, we think of the liver as just like this big detox organ. And it is like have a huge detoxification capacity, but it also is responsible for interplay between hormones, hormone conversion. It's responsible for production of blood proteins. It's responsible for the production of certain stimulating factors of blood proteins. Um, It's obviously a breakdown organ. It produces bile for our gut and for itself, for the liver. Um, Yeah. I mean, it's just a multifaceted organ. I mean, pretty much there's 
every other organ system has some correlation or relationship to our hepatic function. It's it's so amazing. And so, I mean, like you said, it's, it touches on hormones, um, produces proteins, blood breakdowns, and obviously detoxification. Um, so you mentioned uh, our bile and uh, let's go into our stool a little bit. So if our if our stool is not brown, um, does that mean our liver is suffering? No, um, discoloration of the stool can mean many different things. Discoloration of the, of the stool can be related to liver issues or like cholestatic, biliary, bile, gallbladder disease. It can also be related to pancreatic disease as well, which is not the liver. So it just depends on like the color of the stool, the um, like the odor of the stool as well, the texture, consistency of the stool, the urgency of the bowel. There's a lot of things that would allow someone to delineate kind of origin um, and then you do further testing to see from where. Okay. All right. And then also let's just take it a step back. Uh, what would you say your specialty is? Is it more on gut health? Is it more on liver? Like what, what do you thrive on? It's kind of both. So with regard to liver, I'm specifically interested in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, Um, just because there's such a huge burgeoning of that now. It's been like that for the past 10 years, actually. So it's not a recent thing, Uh, but it's basically the liver manifestation of metabolic disease, right? And so you have just, we talk about weight disorders in our society. We talk about blood sugar disorders. We talk about lipid disorders and so forth. So fatty liver disease is kind of the liver manifestation of metabolic disease. Um, And so it's really interesting because we're seeing it in pediatric populations now. And the the insidious thing about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is that you don't really have any symptoms with it. So pretty much if somebody has like diabetes or and or obesity, they're already in that category of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, you can pretty much predict the likelihood of someone having non-alcoholic fatty liver disease based on the number of sodas they drink a day or high fructose corn syrup sweetened beverages, which are juices, which a lot of kids drink juices. Is, well, juices is, is not a word, but a lot of kids drink juices and yeah. those are things that have high fructose corn syrup in them. And we now see kids with fatty liver disease beyond juice, you know, processed foods as well have high fructose Mm. corn syrup. So liver and gut, I focus mostly on gut and liver. Okay. Well, I mean, let's, let's dive into that. So, um, can you explain what fatty, I mean, I know you explained a little bit, but can, let's dive into more. What is exactly fatty liver disease? And like you were saying, now pediatrics are experiencing that. And, um, you're also mentioning non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So is there a quote, alcoholic fatty liver disease and what, yeah. And what causes that? I mean, I know you said sugar, but let's dive into it. Yeah. So, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is not the same as alcoholic fatty liver disease. So you have to distinguish them because they pretty much look identical under a microscope. So if you took somebody who had alcoholic fatty liver and somebody had that had non-alcoholic fatty liver, you couldn't tell like what was the culprit. If you looked at their tissues under a microscope, it looks histologically, it looks the same. Um, so that's where you get into like taking a detailed history beyond like the number of drinks someone consumes a day and so forth. But um, they both look the same. It's fatty deposition in the liver, right? So the liver is not a fat storage organ. And so when we start storing fat there, it essentially just messes up the functions of the liver. Eventually, if you have too much fat stored in your liver, it's just kind of like tissue that continually is irritated. Like if you had a scar and you kept, or a scab and you kept picking at it and you kept picking at it, it just continues to scab or it gets worse. Same thing with the liver, it just keeps scarring. So then you'll have, you'll progress to fibrosis, which is scarring of the liver. Um, and then once you get to that scarring phase, it's pretty much irreversible, um, even though you can have fibrosis and still have very much a healthy functioning liver. So just because you have fibrosis of the liver does not mean your liver has, you know, it's not functional. If you continue with all these scars, that's where you get into cirrhosis, where you have pretty much a scar, really scarred up liver. Wow. Okay. So uh, what are, like you said, there are certain things like you can't have like a necessary sign. Are there any signs for not uh, alcoholic fatty liver disease? 
Yeah, I mean, there are signs. Like once you get into more of the severe stages, you're definitely going to see start seeing signs because liver is not working as it should. So when you see alcoholic liver disease, they have ascites, which is like fluid in the belly. So you see these big old bellies. Um, and that's pretty much just fluid. It's not actually fat. Um, and so you'll see that with alcoholic liver disease, you'll see issues with bruising, you see issues with platelets. I mean, you'll see it show up in their blood chemistries, but in terms of early stages, there, there aren't really any signs or symptoms. You may have like fatigue, but everybody has mm-hmm. fatigue. So, right. um, it's not really a specific symptom. And then furthermore, your liver is within a capsule. It's called Gleason's capsule. So unless the liver gets really large and stretches the capsule, you don't have liver pain or right-sided pain. And most times when people have right-sided upper abdominal pain, it's not their liver, it's their gallbladder. And so when somebody has like right-sided abdominal pain, yes, what you think, unless they have like some acute hepatitis, some viral issue or inflammation of the liver where it just gets so big and inflamed that that's when they'll start having pain. But you don't see that with fatty liver disease where the liver is getting so large. So it's usually like more viral acute hepatitis syndrome. Okay. And then why don't you just explain too, where is the liver located? Yeah. So the liver is located on your right side up under the um, right rib cage. Okay. So, and like you're saying, no one can really tell or feel any liver pain quote or anything like that. Yeah. You're not going to feel liver pain. Um, I've seen people who have cirrhosis where their liver is essentially like a raisin. It's like that shriveled up. Um, they don't have pain, you know? So it's like, you really only notice your liver when it's too big. Okay. Where it's inflamed or stretching the area. Okay. So we all know alcohol taxes the liver and like you had mentioned, sugar taxes the liver. Um, specifically, I want to say like agave and corn syrup and all those things. Is there one sugar that taxes the liver more than another? Um, I don't necessarily know what the studies say with regard to that, but I will say, I think that that it's high fructose corn syrup just because it has to do, or agave, because that can be Mm -hmm. an issue too, but it has to do with the like fractionation of the fructose to glucose ratio. And so in nature, you don't really find the amount of fructose that you would find concentrated in like a high fructose corn syrup beverage. Um, And so typically like an apple, it's like, I can't think of the math. I used to know this by heart, but you can kind of do some digging and find out how much fructose content is found in an apple compared to say, like a fructose content and like a sugary drink and just the proportions that you find are just out of proportion to what's, what's natural in nature. So, you know, I, I think about nature and how it just kind of intends for us to consume things in a specific amount. And it's just made that way. And our body's able to deal with it. Furthermore, an apple also has fiber in it, right? It's just so genius how plants are created. You know, it's like, okay, the sugar's here. We know it's not the best, I won't say the best thing that's relative, but we know you need fiber to slow the absorption of it. You have phytonutrients, right? Antioxidants and so forth. Um, so you never see anybody like developing fatty liver disease, being on a fruit diet or even eating a ton of fruit. That's just, that doesn't happen. But because high fructose corn syrup is so much, has so much fructose in it, you have a high uptake of fructose in the liver because you have a certain type of receptor there that will take it up. And so that's why you see more high fructose corn syrup fructose going to the liver because the receptors are there to absorb it there or take it up there. Um, So it's particularly problematic for the liver, I think. So relative to other sugars, I would definitely say high fructose corn syrup and like agave are some of the worst things for the liver. Yeah. And well, and I personally know that a lot of brands now too, they're catching on and they know people don't want to buy high fructose corn syrup. So they're switching up to brown rice syrup, which in my, in my opinion, I, I feel like that's just the same thing, brown rice syrup. It's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so... What, what's That's an interesting. I don't really have a take. I've not really dug a lot into like what brown rice syrup is, like what the makeup looks like relative to the other ones, but it's still like a, you know, highly sh- like simplified, purified type of condensed sugary matrix. So I would, I would not be shocked if it creates the same issues that we see with the other sugars. So. Right. Now what's your, um, what's your take on carbs or re- specifically refined carbs, because I mean, an apple is a carb technically, right? But um, so can refined carbs do the same thing with the the liver? Yes, but not so much as high fructose corn syrup. And I hate to keep saying that, but high fructose corn syrup really is the devil. (laughs) So uh, when it comes to other carbs, like 
Um, not so much. So I, when I see people who have fatty liver disease, I always go through like certain types of um, like foods that they absolutely have to avoid. And I usually include things that are high kind of carby, starchy things like potatoes and corn, like for a certain period of time. Um, and then we'll add in other kind of more root vegetables. Um, like we'll do, um, but what's the name of this vegetable? It's like, it's not cassava. It's something else. And I always, I can never pronounce it correctly, but we'll do different types of like, um, root veggies that they do want that starchy element that's not a potato or um, that's not corn and so forth. Because a lot of the people that I find with fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, they eat like a high sugary diet and they also eat a lot of kind of like fast food diet or Mm -hmm. um, just poor quality foods. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go into a little bit like what are some herbs and natural ways to detoxify and help support the liver? Yeah. So the simplest thing is when somebody has like um, specifically fatty liver disease is weight loss. So we know that when somebody loses around six to 10% of their body weight, it actually improves their liver and you don't have to do a biopsy. We know that that liver histologically will improve just with that amount of weight loss. So those are things I just recommend, just simple dietary lifestyle modifications. Beyond that, um, everybody always talks about milk thistle for the liver, but it really is such a beautiful botanical when you look at the studies around hepatic function. You have to be careful of where you're sourcing your milk thistle because there are some studies detailing milk thistle actually being a source of like a heavy metal contamination like lead, which can negatively affect the liver. So um, I would say make sure you're choosing a company that third party tests, tests for heavy metals, pesticides, insecticides, and like um, bacteria or microorganisms as well. But milk thistle is amazing. It's really great liver protective. It upregulates liver antioxidant systems. It helps with glutathione in the liver. Your liver has the most glutathione of any organ in the body. It's the highest concentrated organ for glutathione. Um, So I always recommend supporting glutathione pathways as well. Um, Different amino acids will recommend as well or glutathione therapy. I love um, when it comes to botanicals, there's a great Vietnamese botanical. You can't really find it anymore anywhere. It's called Gynostemma pentaphylum. Well, I used to have a, <laughs> I know it's so long, um, but it's gyno, like gynecologist, but gyno and stemma, S T E M M A. So gynostemma. And then the last name is pentaphylum, like a pentagram, pentaphylum family. And so, um, That one is harder to find, but it's a really old, it's considered like a longevity botanical in this Vietnamese culture. And it's some really cool, there are some really cool studies around its ability to help with fatty liver disease and also with like diabetes and weight management. So I love it, but um, it's hard to find, I guess I'll say a clean uh, gynostema product. Okay. And I've also heard like dandelion and burdock can, can possibly help. Yes, dandelion is great for supporting hepatic processes. It's also great for like supporting bile flow through the liver. Um, so that's one's like a bitter. I'll recommend like dandelion greens. Whenever I see them at the grocery store in the fall or whenever they have them, I always get them and I always make like dandelion greens. Like if you were to make spinach or something, I'll do that. They're really great bitter herbs and bitters help to stimulate digestive processes. And just like, you know, when we have a bitter, we kind of do that twist of our mouth. I feel like our gut does the same thing and it just kind of releases like bile and different like stomach acid is also um, something that bitters can be used for supporting stomach processes. And then burdock is also a really good one. Burdock also has some studies around its ability to support glutathione, this antioxidant in the liver, and you can just do the liquid form. So burdock tea is really helpful instead of, you know, taking capsules. There's so many capsules and supplements these days. Like I think a tea is a really great solution. So I love burdock tea. You can also just eat burdock, um, like a root vegetable and you can find it at like Asian supermarkets, but they'll usually just have burdock, fresh burdock root. And I just chop it up and like make a burdock carrot salad. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Like correct me if I'm wrong, but burdock they're a really long root, right? A long yep. skinny. It's long light. skinny root. Uh huh. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, now, I did want to ask you. You did mention teas, so I know there's milk thistle tea, there's burdock tea, there's dandelion tea. Are teas better than capsules, and then versus tinctures? What is the best way to consume a, a, a supplement or an herb? 
And it really depends on what constituent you're looking for. And so um, not all plant constituents are water soluble. So you can't pull everything out in the tea versus some are more, you have to have a more potent solvent. So something like, like, um, like an ethanol or like an alcohol. So a tincture might be useful. So for example, milk thistle is not good in a tea. You won't get the benefits, the hepatic liver benefits. If you're doing a tea, you need a stronger kind of solvent to pull out the antioxidant or the molecules you're looking for. So the silymarin and the silibin, silibinin, I can never say that word, but there are constituents in milk thistle that you want to pull out and you're not going to get them with a tea. So if you boil them, they have to be boiled. I think at a high temperature for a long period of time. Um, and even then, I don't think the like bioavailability is there. So I would say it depends on what you're looking for in terms of what you're using the botanical for. Some studies show that things like burdock, you can just drink a tea and that actually exerts the benefits. You're actually pulling out the antioxidant molecules you're, you want. Um, so I think if you're going with a supplement, you want to know if it's a herb, if the herb has been standardized to have a like specific constituent in it. So you'll see, I'm trying to think of one. Um, if you take, I can't think of one, but if you take, um, like I think ginkgo is one, you can see that it's like some ginkgo is standardized to contain ginkalides, right? It'll say we contain this amount and this is what you look for in the studies, these specific aspects of the plant. So it's just a, a matter of being mindful of the company, what extraction techniques they're using, um, and if they say their product contains X amount of this clinical molecule. Oh, lavender is one. So oh, interesting. there's a really cool lavender formulation um, it's called, the molecule is called Silexin, but it's in two different products that I'm familiar with. And it's been actually the molecule that's been clinically shown to help with anxiety and helping people with reducing their anxiety. But when I recommend this product, I always recommend looking for a product that has Silexin in it, which is the, the, the standardized like lavender molecule. Okay. All right. Well, um, I want to kind of switch gears from just fatty liver disease in general, but also because our liver plays uh, other roles as well. So are there any signs beyond fatty liver disease or are there any signs that our liver is suffering such as acne? I know you mentioned low energy or stool color. Uh, Is there anything that we can look for? Yeah. So when you think about um, issues with liver function, there's an entire post I did around like the skin, I think the skin liver axis in regards to things we may notice on our skin. One of those things is like bruising can be an issue. Um, if somebody is easily bruising, it could be because they have low platelets and that could be an issue with liver function. It could be many other things as well. Um, if you notice like um, change in colors to your stool or excessive coloration of your stool, yellow stools, um, or more like the yellow greenish color stool that can be point to the liver biliary area. Um, when it comes to skin, there's like, um, I think it's like palmar erythema where the palms in the hand are more red and they should be, that can be related to so many issues, but there are correlations as well with, um, with the liver. If somebody has like a bronzing of their skin, that could be like a liver iron storage disorder, hemochromatosis. So there are many things you can deduce from like visually observing someone if they have like yellowing of the whites of their eyes, like jaundice, and that could point to some kind of like um, cholestatic liver issue as well, where the bile is really congested. Um, So yeah. So those are just like signs that basically your body just can't detoxify uh, to its optimum, uh, I guess, because of the liver, it it just can't do its job um, sufficiently, basically. Yeah. I think, you know, our body speaks to us all the time, you know, and these are just kind of signs and signals. And our liver is such an important organ that it will communicate with us via our skin, our eyes, our hair, our stools, our, you know, our abdomen, ascites, you know, fluid in the belly. There's so many signs to evaluate for liver issues. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the fluid in the belly Mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when somebody has ascites, what that means is they have like this collection of fluid in their abdomen. Typically that happens when they have like a really severe or more um, fibrotic, cirrhotic liver. So their liver is more scarred up than usual. And what ends up happening is you get this backflow. And so all the things that's flowing into the liver kind of just, because the liver is like, if you think about like a, um, like a filter you have on, I don't know, like a, 
like a, a faucet or something. If the filter is kind of just really clogged up and, you know, cruddy, the water that's trying to come through the filter, it's not going to be able to come through the filter. So it has to go somewhere. So it's either going to explode or push back into the where it's coming from. So that's how I think about it when I explain kind of ascites. So if you have the liver where things are supposed to be flowing into the liver, getting filtered out, detoxified and so forth, but the liver is more like um, scarred up. It's like a raisin. It's not going to be able to flow through as easily. So it kind of backflows and that backflows where you start to have kind of fluid building up in the abdomen. Wow. So let's, this is a perfect just kind of segue here. So the gut liver connection, Mm -hmm. how does that, um, how does the liver play a role in our gut specifically? Yeah. So um, our gut communicates with the liver approximately 66, it's over two thirds. So I'm going to say 66% of blood flowing into the liver is coming from our gut. 66%. Yeah. So the gut directly influences our liver and then our liver creates bile and the bile goes into the gut via the small intestines. And it actually can affect the microbiome of the gut along with absorption of fat, soluble vitamins and so forth. So they literally share a direct correlation. So would you say that a distressed gut affects the liver or would you say a distressed liver affects the gut? It's both. The studies show both. Yeah, it's both ways. Um, And so when you have a distressed microbiome or gut, that actually, so when you have like something called um, leaky gut or intestinal hypermeability, what happens is because most of the blood flowing into the liver is going to come to the, like most of the blood flowing into the liver is coming from the gut. What actually happens is the gut will send its kind of LPS microbial products and the liver will receive them. And what happens is the liver will start turning up its immune processes. Specifically, you'll see increases in the Kupfer cells, which are liver macrophages, like liver immune cells, basically. They start increasing. You see more liver inflammatory processes, but the liver is such a beautiful organ and it has the most glutathione because it deals with the most oxidation. I, well, I wouldn't say the most oxidation, but I'll say that it has the most glutathione because it is doing so many processes that require detoxification. And that can be a huge stressor on the body. So that's why I believe glutathione is most concentrated in the liver. Glutathione is our most powerful antioxidant. And so because the gut is influencing the liver, the liver already has like a built-in system to deal with this. But over time, if you have a continually dysbiotic gut environment that does put stress and strain on the liver. And a lot of folks who have liver disease also have SIBO, small intestine bacteria overgrowth. And so their correlation there is thought to be associated with many things. But one of those things is bile. And one feature of bile is, so bile is a fluid that's made by the liver. It's stored in the gallbladder. If you don't have a gallbladder, you still make bile. You just don't have the gallbladder to store it. Um, So bile goes into the gut and it actually can um, keep in balance our gut microbiome. So it has its own, um, actions on our microbiome in terms of balancing it out. So you see in people who have liver issues, they have a high amount of SIBO, small intestine bacteria overgrowth. Um, and so they, they are directly correlated when you have liver issues, you typically have gut issues and so forth. Um, when we had, when I was in residency, I've seen people with like end stage liver disease. And these are people who have to be on medications like lactulose, which is something that you take to go to the bathroom. It's basically a, an agent for constipation, but um, they have to be on that because their body is so inefficient at detoxification that they cannot keep accumulating stool in their body. And so they have to go to the, like take their lactulose a few times a day to continually get the stool out. Um, and there's a more complicated process associated with that, but you have to uh, like work with their gut. If somebody has liver disease, you have to get the poop out. Many of you listening are probably already aware that I co-created the Digestive Support Protein Powder by NewZest back in 2018. Why? Because it actually works. Unlike other vegan protein powders, mine is made without stevia, fake sweeteners, gums, or natural flavorings. And let me tell you, these additives can really wreak havoc on our digestive system. I also included a specific probiotic scientifically proven to fight off candida and support the gut within the powders. 
you're not only getting clean protein powder, but also things that actually support the gut, as well as L-glutamine, which helps restore the gut lining. My digestive support protein is vegan, paleo, and keto friendly, as well as suitable for those on a candida or diabetic diet. It is also glyphosate free and contains no gluten, grains, or lectins. And if you want to grab a tub and start your journey to a healthier and happier gut and ultimately happier life, go to newsest.us slash digest for a discount and experience what countless others have. Everything is just so intricate and I feel like it all goes back to diet and lifestyle because I feel like there's just more and more diseases and complications as this every generation comes about. I, I, I feel like we didn't have all this, you know, hundreds of years ago with our ancestors. And now because of more packaged foods and processed things, we're developing all these different diseases that no one ever had. Exactly. A hundred percent agree with that. And I definitely think it just has to do with our, the industrialization and the commercialization of all the things. So, yeah. And I, I feel like also it, I think the wellness space or the nutrition space in general, I feel like it's a lot of it is greenwashed. And so the public thinks they're purchasing excuse me, purchasing something that's really good for them when it's just marketed as a healthy alternative. But it's really, when you turn around it's and look more at the label, processed. It is, yes, thank you. Or it's has fake sugar, which, you know, doesn't really do anything either. It doesn't satisfy you and it causes gut issues and headaches and things like that. So uh, what kind of diet would you recommend for someone that's maybe suffering from, I'll actually have another question too, but what kind of diet would you recommend for someone that is maybe suffering from liver, uh, liver disease or bloating and things like that? And also uh, going back to bloating, if someone is constantly bloated, should they look into their, um, the, their liver and should they get tested? So um, I know those are two separate questions. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> With regard to bloating and the liver, um, I have not really seen so much bloating be associated with the liver. Okay. Unless someone has like, they're saying ascites or something else is bloating. That's not bloating. It's something else. But and with ascites, there's fluid in the belly. So that's not bloating. But um, I've never, I've not really seen too much bloating be associated with liver issues. Unless liver is severely damaged, you won't really run into issues around like, thing bloating relative to liver issues. But, um, when I think of bloating, I always think of digestive processes. I think of constipation. It's like the top cause for gas and bloating, because when you have poop just sitting out in the gut, the bacteria will eat on it like it's dessert and they just produce gas, gas, gas. So that's what I always work on is their microbiome. Dysbiosis is a huge factor. SIBO is something that's another thing. And people will say, as soon as I eat, after I eat, I look pregnant and they'll show me pictures mm-hmm. before and after. Usually it's always SIBO. Um, so those are things I think of when I think of bloating syndromes. Um, the other question you asked in regards to specific diet for liver. Yeah, I mean, I just kind of recommend avoidance and minimization of environmental toxins and just, you know, eating the best quality foods. I mean, obviously I do a whole like, okay, we're obviously done with sodas and high fructose corn syrup and all those types of things. Um, but when you look at it, you want to, you know, reduce the burden on the liver. And the simplest way to do that is to reduce like the input of exogenous toxins or toxins that we may not realize we are encountering like, you know, things like burning candles, right. Or, you know, because breathing fragrances because when you yeah. breathe things in actually there's like a whole gut lung axis as well and so breathing things in it doesn't just stay in the lungs so um i'll definitely go over just some simple housekeeping stuff around that but reducing environmental burden so trying to do you know the most clean produce the most clean foods it doesn't necessarily always mean organic i always recommend shopping with local farms there's a farm here they don't have the organic certification because it's so expensive but all of their produce is really just top notch um so yeah things like that 
Yeah. And that's something that I always like to point out too, is that a lot of people can't afford the organic certification. And for those that don't know, companies have to pay to get that stamp of approval. They have to pay for the non-GMO. They have to pay for all those different certifications. And a lot of companies just don't have that extra money to do so, even though all of their products are grown organic or all of their ingredients are organic. It's just another bill that they have to, it's not just a one-time thing. I believe they have to pay yearly to, yeah. to these companies. And so that's just something to keep in mind that just because it doesn't say organic, you know, it doesn't mean it's, it's not necessarily. Exactly. Exactly. So um, things like that. And then be mindful of medications because there's a lot of drug induced liver injury. Um, and so many medications can contribute to that. So, and what about an over, um, overuse of Advil and Tylenol and all that kind of stuff? So those things are obviously very damaging for the gut. Um, they can also have effects on the liver, but they're more so a negative in the intestinal tract because they directly impact our mucus lining and they affect many different pathways in our gut for inciting gut damage. When you have like damage to your mucus layer, that's, that's leaky gut, that's intestinal hyperpermeability. What happens is because of that, that can lead to more of these like um, microbial associated products going to the liver, whereas they were secured or isolated in the gut. Now you have more like likelihood of those things to go to the liver. Okay. Um, and now if someone is constantly constipated, if they're always constipated, chronic constipation, uh, obviously they're not able to, um, I guess, detox their bodies and mm -hmm, it's just building right. up in there. Um, now, should that person, because I actually, I used to have SIBO um, a long time ago and thankfully that's long gone. But uh, if someone is chronically constipated, should that be a sign for them to check their liver or... Nah, no. I wouldn't say more so check the liver. Um, when you think about the causes of constipation, they're not really due to, or in my, in my experience, and I've seen like literally thousands and thousands of GI cases and liver cases. So when I think about constipation, I never really see an association with like liver. Um, even when somebody has like severe liver disease, you never really see like it being a cause of like constipation per se. Um, if somebody has constipation, I always go through these kind of like steps. So I'll ask them about their diet, right? I want to know what they eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just to kind of see what their intake is and what foods they could be eating that could be slowing their bowels down or how much fiber they're getting. I want to know about hydration because when you're dehydrated, your colon is like a reservoir for hydration. So your body's going to pull it from your stools. And if your stools are dry and hard, you're going to be constipated. I want to know about their history of antibiotic use or dysbiosis, right? Because you look at people who have IBS, which is categorically like IBS, either constipation or diarrhea, they have tons of dysbiosis. I ask about that. I want to know about the history of like eating disorders because that can also contribute to slowness of the intestinal um, transit because those nerves are just not used to working per se. So there are many factors associated with constipation, um, but liver is not one that I would think I would jump to um, immediately. Okay. Now, if someone is trying to lose weight and they're doing all of the things, they're eating right, they're exercising, they, they've cut the junk out, but they're still not able to do that. Um, I know the liver does affect the metabolism. Is, is that right? And could that be a factor if they're trying to lose weight and just can't? And could their liver be suffering? If someone is trying to lose weight and they cannot, could their liver be suffering? Hmm, possibly. Um, it just depends on what, how we're quantifying that because you can, there's so many tests you can use to actually quantify objectify liver function, um, or quantify and qualify liver function. And you can do your typical transaminases. So your ALT, your AST, you can do your GGT. So GGT is a marker that's an indirect marker for actual antioxidant status as well. People don't know that. They just think it's like a marker of like liver inflammation and it is, but um, GGT is one that I will always like kind of consider and ask people to get. It's a really cheap test to, to order. Um, 
And then if you had like any type of abdominal ultrasound, see if there's some abnormality there. But when it comes to like supporting the liver processes, I mean, I will do things around like dandelions and um, just bitters and, you know, like um, bile flow agents to help support the natural processes of the body. But when it comes to like weight loss, I mean, there could be correlation there with hormones, right? Cause their liver also is associated with different hormone pathways also. So possibly, right? So if somebody has some thyroid issue per se and their thyroid hormones are not converting in the liver, then it could be a liver issue. Maybe that's why they're not losing weight, but directly associated with liver, um, I really could not speak to that. And I work with a lot of metabolic disease cases as well. A lot of like um, weight and diabetes cases. And I never really see a direct correlation with like just liver support, like milk thistle and dandelion and bitters and increased um, weight loss. So that's just from my experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause I, it's just so interesting because I know the liver, like you had said, there is a direct correlation with like the gut liver connection. And if your gut is out of balance, then that can affect so many other things like like your hormones or like your metabolism. And, you know, it's just, it's so, it's so good for someone to really know and look into all areas and not just one if they're having issues. Um, now, how can one test t- uh, to see how their liver is doing or can they? And like you were, you were talking about a, a, a few tests. So how can one go about that? Yeah. So when it comes to um, liver tests, typically when you have basic blood work done, you're going to have like your CMP, which is you're going to have your liver enzymes on there. It'll have bilirubin. It'll have a few other markers that can be insightful for liver, like your albumin. Um, So I would say looking at your basic blood work and then a GGT is another test that you can ask to have added on. It's specific to the liver, but it's not really sensitive or, or it's sensitive to the liver, but it's not specific. So it's sensitive, meaning like we know this is liver, but it's not specific to say it's this liver issue or that liver issue. It's just kind of like one of these general markers. But if you look at the studies around GGT, it is useful for um, acknowledging the antioxidant status. So usually if you have like a really high GGT, it can be indicative of like low glutathione or low antioxidant status and so forth. It can also be associated with like a higher environmental toxin load um, for the liver. So that's something else that I will kind of look into Beyond that, you know, there aren't like other, there's not like a liver, a functional liver test yet. Hopefully it's coming, but you know how we have all these stool tests now. There's not like one functional liver test that I've seen that will be useful um, or just an insightful test per se. But yeah. Okay. So do you have to go through your regular practitioner or can you go to an outside lab and get these and request and pay out of pocket? Yeah, you can get them out of pocket. You can get go to Ulta Labs. I think they have an independent, um, well, they definitely, you can definitely order them from Ulta Labs. You can order them under a practitioner or you can order them yourself. I'm not sure what the price difference is or if there is a price difference doing one over the other, but you can definitely get on Ulta Labs, U-L-T-A Labs. And they have all the liver, they have every test pretty much. So you can order your ALT, your AST, you can order your GGT, um, you can order the other like albumin, your bilirubin, you can order all these markers there. A- Alclos, you can order all of these things there. Okay, great. So someone can pay out of pocket and go there to Ulta Labs, or they can hopefully, if they have insurance, they can talk to their practitioner and request that. Correct. Okay. And now I, you did mention uh, about home care and things that are around our environment. And so what should we be doing to make sure that our liver is not toxified by whatever we are experiencing, whether that's scents or soaps or things like that? I would just say, you know, um, like you just said, so scents. So just minimize the artificial scents as much as possible. Even like, I think essential oils can be excessive sometimes um, if they're used all the time. And, you know, when you think about even essential oils and how they're just super concentrated, like in nature, you don't find a bottle of lemon essential oil, you know, hanging out in the tree. You just don't, because it's, it's, it's still a chemical compound. So I would say be mindful of the amounts of any types of like natural 
oil products or anything you're breathing in, you know, um, if you do use candles or incense, I always recommend people put them by the window and crack the window. You know, if you just love this scent and it reminds you of this time in your life, that's fine. You know, I would say just try to minimize the amount of your exposure to it or burn it and open the window. So it's going out the window. Um, I guess we're polluting the environment then, but anyways, <laughs> speaking like, oh. um, but, um, I would say same thing with body washes and soaps, like minimal fragrance, the best products. I typically say it's just better to shop. I like shopping at this store called fresh time. I used to have a sprouts when I lived in Arizona. I'm just shopping at like kind of local health food, health related stores. You'll find a better variety of clean products that I think, um, would be to your liking versus like shopping at like a big chain store. Um, so those are some thoughts around that. And then like when it comes to foods, like shopping at co-ops or, you know, going to the local farmer's market and talking to the farmers about what their produce and products um, are like. Um, yeah. Chemicals they use. Those are great tips. And something I like to do, I don't really like to burn candles uh, either myself for many reasons. One, sense. And two, I just, I feel like they're dangerous. I'm like, what if I leave the room and it's like <laughs> going to catch a fire or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but something that is helpful too is I get like a little, um, not teapot, but like a little pot on the stove and you can put in lemon rinds, you can put in yep. cinnamon and you can just boil that and it just makes your house smell amazing. It does. So um, what are those other ones? Uh, cloves. Even you, you can get like whole oh, cloves. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love so, putting some cinnamon sticks in a pot and I'll just leave it on. It smells so good. Perfect. Yeah. That's so easy and it, it, it'll, it's a lot cheaper too. So great. Um, those are some great tips. Now, can we touch a little on water and not just drinking water, but also what we shower and things like that and how that affects us? Yeah. So, you know, when you think about water, it obviously gets absorbed across our skin. Right. And so, you know, even showering, you know, I was approached the other day in my neighborhood, I guess they're saying there may be lead pipes that our water is running through in our neighborhood. So they want to replace those pipes. And so, you know, lead can be, these things can be absorbed across our skin. And so I think, you know, just testing your water there, you can get these like, um, parts per million kind of just total dissolved solid meters from Amazon, like 10 bucks. And so they're just little bitty meters. You stick it in your water and it'll tell you how many parts per million dissolve, of total dissolved solids. So total dissolved solids is like a combination of all the things that could be possibly in the water. Um, pollutant agents, it can be even medications, right? But they're not specifying what types are in there. They're just saying these are the dissolved parts in these waters. And so pretty much you don't want your water to have a ton of total dissolved solids contained within it. And so there are certain stipulations that are set. So you have heavy chlorinated water in our areas or the city waters are heavy chlorinated, um, heavily chlorinated to kind of get rid of this and neutralize. But you can totally check out the amounts of total dissolved solids in your water. Um, there shouldn't be like a too excessive. I think mine is like around 200 for the city water, but my friend in Arizona, hers is like 600 every time she tests her water um, in Arizona. And so for that, I'm like, you should definitely have a filtration device on your shower, the water you bathe. Well, I don't drink my faucet water. And I didn't think that that was still a thing, but um, it is a thing, you know, and I think if you're going to drink faucet water, you need to be making sure the water is filtered. Yeah. And I think there's another, there's websites. I'm just trying to look it up. I know there's a few, you can go, I think it's, um, ewg.org. And you put your zip code in, yeah. um, it's like ewg.org slash tap water. I think you can put your zip code in and it'll tell you what's in your water, where you live. You'll see a lot of like, um, what do they call them? Like chemicals that they use to, I guess, make the water safe, reduce like microbes and microorganisms. So you'll see a lot of those in there. Things like chlorine, things like, um, I'm not sure they use bromine, but um, you'll see a ton of like chlorine and chlorine related compounds in, on that list that they deem as safe, but I don't really know if it's safe. But sometimes you'll see also, I think there was arsenic in my water, a oh, high oh amount of arsenic. God. And I was like, good grief. So yeah, it's, it's really jarring when you actually start digging into the environment and what we're exposed to and how these things affect our health. There's actually studies around um, fatty liver disease and heavy metals as well. Oh man. Yeah. And I, um, for my drinking water, I use a, an Aqua true water filter. Yeah. I use Aqua true too. Okay. 
Uh, is it Agua True or Aqua True? <laughs> Honestly, I don't even know because there's Aqua another company <laughs> called Aquasana and I always get them mixed up and I was on the wrong website. So maybe it's Agua True. I don't know. I'm like, have I been saying it wrong this whole time? Um, but I love that water filter and it literally t- filters my tap water and it filters it so well that it takes all the minerals out and, and even the good ones. So I have to put back the good minerals, which I'm fine, but um, it's so important. What, the water, the quality of water you're drinking and also, yeah, what you're showering in. And I know it's hard to just get away from everything. I mean, even the the smog and the, the toxins. In the I know, know, I mean, you, you know, do what but- you can, right? Um, but I try not to freak out about it too much. Like I do have an air doctor that I use mm-hmm. and to clean the air inside the home. And I have the Agua True, Aqua True, however you say it. I have that device and I just try to minimize things. And there are like incense that I love, but I just don't, I don't buy them. And I just like, you know, <laughs> just leave them. But I, I do like some of the smell goods and I totally understand it, but it's just, for me, like, I think if I was like a hundred and a hundred, I wouldn't care. I just do anything I wanted to do. I would burn all the incense. Who cares? Right. But it's like, I have so much life to live. I guess, you know, I need to be mindful of these things. Well, yeah. And you want to live a good, not just live a life, but you want to live a good quality life, you know? And, and that's, that goes to another thing too, because with all these different things and hearing X, Y, and Z that's happening, it's very easy to stress over it. And Mm -hmm to like over stress about every little thing. And I feel like stressing about it can cause issues as well. Exactly. Exactly. There's no, exactly. I agree a hundred percent. And, you know, there's so much, there are also so many issues with access to resources, you know? And so that's something that I'm really passionate about. And it's just, when we talk about these things also in the health and wellness space, there's an entire group of people, a majority of people who just don't have access, you know, to some of the things that we are even aware of, you know, when I talk to certain people in my community about, you know, um, like air doctors or air purifiers in the home, it's like, what, why would I need that? You know? So I think education goes a long way and then access to just safe environments to walk outside and get sunlight every day. Like that's the thing that's not available where I live. You know, I would never walk outside in my neighborhood ever. Um, and so I just think also we have to be mindful of, you know, discussing ways that many people can benefit from these simple tools that they may seem simple, but not, may not be so simple for other people. No, I, I totally agree. I love that, Dr. Asia. Um, now, before we before we close, what would you recommend or what are the maybe the top three things that you would tell someone to start or pivot their health journey? Um, I would say the first thing would be something related to the mind. I'm a really huge advocate for mind-body medicine. Um And I just think everything starts as a thought in the mind and manifests later on in some capacity in our body or in our life. So I would say considering some type of daily mind practice. And so for me, that can be as simple as mindfully chopping an onion, (laughs) being fully (laughs) present while I'm chopping this onion. Or it can be doing some Headspace of my app, Headspace app, and doing one of their five-minute meditations. But I would say some daily mindful practice is very powerful. And I would say you know, affirming what you want to have happen with your health, you know? So if you have fatty liver disease, you have to tell yourself like, my liver is healthy. I have a healthy liver and it's fully capable of X, Y, and Z. And it's so powerful how we start to change our life just based on our words. It's actually something called autogenic training where we use our language to teach our body. And you literally just repeat stuff to yourself. Like my arm is warm and you can say that over and over. So things like warm can represent muscle relaxation and your muscles will actually start to relax. These are things that have been studied. So I just say, talk to yourself, um, <laughs> talk to yourself, but not like crazy way, but talk to yourself <laughs> all day, every day, all the positive things. Um, secondarily, I would say do as much as you can when it comes to eating the best foods, but don't stress about it. Um, try to, you know, make relationships with your local farmers and so forth. But I would say do as best as you can with that try to get in as many kind of, um, there's a lot of controversy around plants these days, but I'm a fan of plants. Um, I would say if you can get some antioxidants in and other phyto plant nutrients, totally try to do that in some way. Blueberries are excellent. Um, I would say the last thing is go to the bathroom, strive to go to the bathroom every day. And that's because the normal physiological mechanism for 
a bowel movement is first thing in the morning. So overnight we're in that parasympathetic rest digest. So in the morning we should get up, have a nice release and then go on about our day. If you don't have that happening, you should be going at least at some point in the day, but aiming for one poop every day is I think something really powerful and simple. Yeah, that's amazing. And this is, um, well, I I feel like my listeners are not, uh, we, we talk about poop all the time. So, (laughs) but, but, um, that is true. And I feel like once you have a good release that releases hormones, that uh, excess hormones in your stool, you know, um, other toxins. And so there's been instances where I myself have felt so toxic and I've had a bowel movement and like, immediately my head feels clearer. Exactly. Like I, can I understand exactly where you're coming from. Like there are times I have a headache and I already know my body is like, I need to go to the bathroom. And as soon as I go, the headache is gone. Like I, I totally understand where you're coming from when it comes to having a nice release and what that does for your peace of mind and your mental health. Yeah, for sure. Great, great tips. Now, where can people find you? Pimp, pimp yourself out. Where are you? So my, the only social media I have is Instagram. I do a lot of just education on the platform. So you'll see a lot of this content about gut, liver, metabolic related topics there. There's a ton of like really cool free information there. Um, I have a website. I don't really have a blog on my website, but you can just go read there to learn more about me. It's just asiamohammed.com. Um, yeah, so I have a TikTok. I don't know how to work it. So don't find me there. It's nothing there. But Instagram okay. is where you can find me. Instagram and you are? Oh, sorry. Dr. Asia Muhammad. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and joining me. I know my listeners are going to be thrilled with all this information that you're putting out and all the education that you are putting out into the world. And I really appreciate this. Thank you. I appreciate you so much. It was a nice conversation. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digest This. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in your podcast app to let us know. If you're ever wondering how you can support me and this podcast, sharing it with your friends and family is the best way. This is a Resonant Media production produced by Drake Peterson and edited by Chris McComb. To email the show, message us at digestthispod at gmail.com. See you next time. The content of this show is for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for individual medical and mental health advice and does not constitute a provider-patient relationship. As always, talk to your doctor or health team first. Looking to build a more robust foundation in your health and well-being? From the producer of Digest This comes one of the most popular alternative health shows on Apple Podcasts, The Dr. Tina Show. Dr. Tina Moore is a naturopathic physician and chiropractor, traditionally and alternatively trained in science and medicine. The show features exclusive interviews with experts such as Sean Stevenson, Mike Mutzel, Mark Groves, and even solo episodes covering metabolic health, pharmaceuticals, chronic diseases, long hauler syndrome, and pain management. Dr. Tina delivers the information in a no-nonsense, real-world style, and she has the science to back it up. The Dr. Tina Show is edgy, entertaining, and informative. Every episode will leave you with a new pearl of health wisdom to expand your knowledge base. When you're empowered, you can do better for yourself, your family, and your community. Resilience is the name of the game, and Dr. Tina is here to guide you on your way. Listen to The Dr. Tina Show today on your favorite podcast app. New episodes every Wednesday. Produced by Drake Peterson and Resident Media.